good to see you in church. We are so glad you're able to worship with us. We just have a couple announcements we want you to be aware of. Uh, first off, next week is, is a very, very, it's not even bittersweet, it's just bitter. That is all next Sunday is. It's Pastor Larry's last Sunday that we get to celebrate, to honor with him, worship alongside him, and also celebrate 44 years of Christian ministry and congregational setting. Uh, it is uh, bitter for us. It is gloriously sweet for him. Uh, and so with that being said, we will be at 1030 next Sunday. It's only going to be one worship service at 1030 together. Uh, so just pay attention to that. All that information is also in the soundings. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us. Let us go to God together in prayer this morning. Everlasting God, this hour is for you. Help us to reflect. Help us to sit in your presence and to expect to feel something, to be moved by your love. In your son's name that we pray. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move.
Thanks be to God. Once again this week, our children's sermon will be up on the screen. And just enjoy. We're all children. Well, today in our Bible story, there are some things about customs and traditions, too. In the story, there is a really great guy. His name's Cornelius, and he loves God so much, and he helps the poor. He just does good things. And there's another man. His name is Peter. He's a disciple of Jesus's, and he's also a good man. And I'm sure he also helped the poor and did lots of good things. But there's one big difference. Cornelius is a Gentile, and Peter is not. He is Jewish. And those groups didn't always get along, remember? They had different things they believed, different, different traditions, different customs. And one of those had to do with food. Yep, that's right, food. The Jewish people believed that there were some foods that they should not eat. And there were some foods that they should be eating. A lot of different religions do talk about food. Well, in the story, Cornelius had a vision or a dream from God. And he was told, you need to send somebody to go get Peter. Well, he listened to God and he sent some of his friends and family. Somebody went to get Peter to bring him back to his house. And right about the same time, Peter had a vision, a dream from God. And he told him, you know, all of these things that I make for food, they're all good. They're good. Well, Peter was confused because being Jewish, he'd never eaten some of those ever in his whole life. But God was saying, if I made them, how can they not be good? Okay, Peter listened to that part, and then Somebody's coming to get you to visit Cornelius. Go with them. Well, the people came. They got Peter. They went to Cornelius' house. And by the end of this story, everybody had talked and listened and accepted things from each other and learned from each other. And Peter realized God wasn't just talking about food. He was talking about the people, just like he had made all the food, so it had to all be good. God made all the people. They were all good, too. It didn't matter if you were a Gentile. It didn't matter if you were Jewish. God made everybody, which means God loves everybody. So, for this story, we need to remember that one custom and tradition that God wants us to carry on with is that of accepting everybody and loving everybody and taking care of each other because that is exactly what God wants us to do.
We are all caught in liminal spaces. As individuals, as a family, as a country, as a people group, we are all in the in-between. Now, we're not going to stay this way, but we are in this. So we have some decisions to make. We can either step back in fear or forward in faith. For the last seven weeks, we've looked at biblical stories that have helped us get the energy to step forward. Towards Christ is what we're arguing. And we have one more story to share. This is the last one in our sermon series, and it's the story of, as Janice said, Cornelius and Peter. And it's from Acts chapter 10. Now, this is a crazy long story. I mean, it's over 40 verses. It would take all of our time just to read it. So I'm going to have to skip over parts of it. But promise me you will go back and read it. Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 10. It is Acts chapter 10. If you remember anything, it is Acts chapter 10. And when you read it, read it slowly because it's game changing, narrative altering. It's a story that officially moves the church forward and its characters get moved forward too. And I think it bears the capacity to usher us out of liminal space towards Christ. So let's jump into it. The chapter opens like this, in, chapter, in verse 1. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all of his household. He gave alms generously to the people, and he prayed constantly to God. Now, already this is odd. Something is off here. Cornelius is a Roman officer. He should be worshiping, not God, but Caesar. And scripture says that he loves God, that he leads his household to love God. I mean, already there is a shift in the way things are supposed to be. Roman officers, especially centurions, they should be model citizens of the empire. They represent who we should aspire to be within Caesar's kingdom. And that's the one who worships God? I mean, something really is shifting here. This is the in-between. The old is loosening its grip, and something new is emerging. So let's keep reading verse 3. One afternoon at about 3 o'clock, he, Cornelius, had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. All right, all right. Now there's a bit more to the setting here. A leading Roman officer needs Peter. The rock on which the Rome's army is built needs Peter. The rock on which the church is built. These are two colossal figures who are now caught in the in-between. All right, let's keep going. This time we get introduced to Peter, who is also dreaming in verse 9. About noon the next day, as they, the servants, were on their journey, they approached the city. Peter went up onto the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord. I've never eaten anything that's profane or unclean. And the voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. 
This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken to heaven. You need to hang on to verse 15. What God has called clean, you must never call profane. At this point, Cornelius' servants arrive to meet Peter and convince him that he should come with them. Peter agrees, but everything is still wrong with this scenario. Now, I hope you can hold how socially uncouth all of this is. And verse 24 helps. The following day, they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him, and falling at his feet, he worshipped Peter. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I'm only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. And then verse 29. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now, may I ask why you sent for me? This is the first major shift that you need to see. Peter acknowledges that this whole scene, it's weird and it's wrong. But he's starting to get that what he thinks is unclean or uncouth, God sees as holy and redeemable. Peter's realizing his dream has prepared him for this moment. This dream was proleptic, and it pulls him out of liminality. Peter has been summoned by an ambassador of Rome to preach, and Cornelius wants to hear the good news of the gospel. Days before, Peter would have denied this claim just based on who it was that was asking. Jews don't mix with Romans. It's unlawful It's uncouth. Verse 28. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now, may I ask, why have you sent for me? All right. Here's where it gets so good for me. Cornelius tells him that an angel appeared to him. And he found Peter, so Peter could come and to preach the gospel. And so that's what's going on here. Verse 33. Therefore I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. And then we get probably the most proleptic verse in all of the Bible. Verse 34. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I'll stop here. This is a story you need to read and reread. It is game changing. It is a glimpse of what the other side of liminal space looks like. It's unitive collective, non-individualistic. For the first time in his life, Peter realizes that the gospel of Jesus Christ actually expands beyond his people group to people that he even hates, people that he even disagrees with, people that he knows would disapprove of him and he disapproves of them. Now, Peter's been taught this before. But this is the first time he lets it change his mind. He allows it to sit in his soul. And this is true for us too. If we're going to step forward out of liminality, then we are stepping into a unitive consciousness, a prolepsis that makes space and room for a mutuality of personhoods. Acts 10 doesn't tell us how to step forward but rather it's the image of what we're stepping into. And this matters for us today. There will be a time when the coronavirus is over. 
There will be a season in which the church will have an opportunity to answer the question, now what? And when that moment comes, we need to be ready to answer it like Peter does. That I truly understand God shows no partiality. Christian mysticism calls this non-dual thinking or non-duality, which is just a terrible phrase. I mean, it makes hardly any sense on the front end, but the more you think about it, meaning starts to develop. No partiality? That means unity. It means non-duality. I mean, think of it like this. In Christ, the us versus them mindset, it dissolves. The right versus left, it fades. The I'm right, you're wrong, I'm in, you're out, I'm good, you're bad, that mindset, it washes away. Duality is the lie that there are only two options, right or wrong, this or that, yes or no, left or right, Cornelius or Peter, Rome versus God. Duality says it has to be one or the other. And our minds, we love duality. We can compare and contrast all the time. We love to judge and discern. But in Christ, that's a waste of time. At, at best, it's trivial. Because in Christ, there's no partiality. In God, there's a right and a left. There's Cornelius and Peter. There's Rome and God. Now, I will say, Non-duality does not apply to all things everywhere. I'm not trying to oversimplify complex truths. I mean, clearly, economics, mathematics, philosophy, sociology, there are dualisms that exist, and there are competing realities that exist. There is a right and a wrong when it comes to math problems. There is a good and bad behavior when it, co when it comes to cognitive development. I'm not suggesting non-duality is a framework that works on all things and is able to hold all things. What I am saying, and something that I think we need to seriously wrestle with in faith, is that our faith should function non-dualistically, non which means this. When we contemplate the God of the universe, when you imagine your small place within the framework of all things, when you imagine how God looks at you but also every single thing else in existence, we must live into the dimensions non-dualistically. In Western culture, the best example of this is a marriage. Two people commit their souls and their bodies to one another. Two are becoming one. So Noel and I are still two separate individuals, which is a dualistic reality. But on a deeper level, or a higher consciousness level, we are actually one. We are unitive. We are bonded in the commitment of love. This is true with our faith in Christ, too. Dualism is such a low form of faith. Hating people, demonizing people, comparing people, and even ideologies, comparing ideologies, that only keeps you stuck in liminality. And it causes you, at best, to take steps backwards in fear. Authentic faith must move beyond dualism and into a mutuality of love. And that love starts when we realize that we belong to God as we are, in who we are. Then we can apply that same attitude towards others, which binds us into the unitive consciousness of God. This happens for Peter, and it happens for us too. We just have to move beyond dualistic notions of how God works. And we have to let the mysteries of God free us and move us and love us. And when we do, 
We're pulled out of the liminal spaces of life and we move forward into a future of faith that is built on love. I want to invite you now into a time of prayer. I have a poem that will be on the screen that we'll meditate on. You can sit, read it, listen, or meditate on it, or just close your eyes in prayer. As we enter into this time, I'll close out our service with a benediction. Would you join me as we pray? And all of God's people said, Amen. Receive this benediction. Depart now in peace, knowing the God of all creation is loving and gracing and redeeming you still. Go in peace.